thanks very much. And thanks to Uga for laying out the kind of um, national framework, national level framework about low carbon development. So I'm going to, my topic is going to bring back the focus back to the UK and to talk about um, the kind of a demand side of response that's been talked about in a policy making level um, um, in, in, in the UK and also has some kind of relevance to China. And the presentation is divided into several parts. Firstly, we're going to talk about the background of low carbon policy making in the UK, especially energy policy. And also, I'm going to introduce my research objective, methodology, and then I'm going to introduce you some kind of um, preliminary findings of my, of my research before I talk about what's the relevance of UK experiences to Chinese low carbon development. The UK is, has been a great leader in the world to promote low carbon um, development path and also um, the carbon emission reduction. And it's also the, the, the first country in the world to, to set legally binding targets for carbon emission reduction. So, um, the, uh, um, Her Majesty Government published um, the, low carbon, the carbon plan delivering our low carbon future back in 2011. And they say, well, by 2020, we're going to reduce the carbon emissions of the UK by 30% and 80% by 2050, which, is re which are really, really ambitious targets. And ever since then, a lot of scholars in, in Oxford, across the, across the UK, have been talking about how we're going to realise this kind of legal dividing targets. In doing so, people identify several areas that we need to focus on. The first one is we're going to produce, uh, we're going to integrate more renewables. Um, because electricity has been a big emitter of the, uh, as a big contributor to the carbon emissions in the UK. So if we want to meet our target um, by 2050, which is like 80% reduction in carbon dioxide emission, we're going to make sure that we totally decarbonize the electricity sector by 2050. And also the European Commission has also set an ambitious target for renewable uh, integration for all the member states, including the UK, so which is like 50% by 2020. UK is on, is on the way to, to, to meet the target quite easily, but after 2020, because we're going to introduce a lot of um, um, renewable energies and also the, the kind of whole discussion in the domestic sector about the rising electricity bills and also the affordability and distribution of facts, how we're going to do that after 2020 is still kind of um, a topic that is you know, a lot of people still debate about that kind of things in this area. And also, part of the low carbon transition plan um, is the electrification of heating and transport. Because people in the UK, we have been realising, we have been relying on natural gas for heating, heating our homes, heating our offices. And we're going to completely switch to um, um, a um, heat pump, basically, the reverse of air conditioning but as soon as possible. By doing that, we're going to increase energy efficiency because um, by the same amount of uh, energy service where we can get, we only consume like 30% of energy as opposed to natural gas and fire heating. Um, transport has been a good contributor as well. So we need to decarbonize the transport sector completely. So we need to kind of promote the um, introduction of electric vehicles. We need to rule out kind of the charging points. But this two point, like electrification of heating and transport, is going to exacerbate the problem of peaking demand. Because in the UK, like around 5 p.m. to 8 p.m., national grid has encountered every day basically. National grid will encounter the peak demand, which is about kind of um, uh, 70 percent more of the average kind of, a, of the daily average load. So if we can reduce the peak demand, we can go to we will make the low carbon targets cost effectively. And finally, which is kind of the elephant in the rooms, which is, you know, reduce, consume less energy. We're going to reduce the uh, overall demand reduction by introducing more energy efficient kind of measures. And also, um, a lot of kind of uh, research institutes in the UK have been done a lot, tons of work on energy, energy efficiency potentials. And people talk about this, especially, you know, the government talk about this. But actually, nothing substantial has been done to, to actually to tap into the um, untapped potentials, to, to bring the kind of, um, to realize untapped potentials of energy efficiency improvement. So, 
against all the three policy objectives people have been talking about, you know, how should we do this, what kind of tools we should use. Smart grid is part of it. Um, I'm going to introduce what, why smart grid is part of it. Because in the smart grid, people are talking about kind of in, in, the, in, in, in the adverts on, on websites, and the flights of British Gas introduced to people, and EDF. We talk about all well, smart grid, you can utilize the, the kind of um, um, differentiated electricity prices throughout the day. For instance, during the daytime, because the electricity will be more expensive, your tariff will be more expensive. But in the evening, when the offices are off and all, all the kind of supermarkets are shot, so actually the load is actually lower than the daytime. So at that time, the price will be cheaper. So if you move your electricity, it's part of your electricity use to, to the evening times, actually you're saving money and you're doing great things to, to the low carbon development. The concept of demand side response, you to kind of um, cap, encapsulate the kind of um, the, the, the paradigm shift that we imagine for smart grid. By demand side response, I'm talking about you shifting some part, part, part of your electricity use to low price periods of time of the day. And then do, by doing that, you can, um, you can, you, you can basically cut the, the peak demand and to optimize the network operation. Because when we plan the electricity grid, we usually plan for the, uh, for the highest peak demand. But when you reduce the peak demand, actually you are, there is less need to, uh, to invest in kind of reinforcement. So actually you're saving a bit. And also because the intermittency renewables, um, in the UK we have a lot of huge potential renewables, offshore wind, offshore wind, and sometimes solar. So if we can, you know, re remove, um, we can, if as consumers we can be flexible with our electricity use, we actually can contribute to the balancing of the system because the electricity system cannot extort, we cannot store the electricity cost effectively now. So if we can, you know, move our demand a bit, be more flexible and be, be more kind of dynamic with our energy consumption, we actually can contribute to the, uh, to the balancing problem and can promote the integration of renewables. Overall reduction in demand, which is simpler, um, because that involves either conservation, we use less, and also involves the introduction of energy efficiency measures like more efficient light bulbs, more efficient refrigerators, air conditioning, that kind of stuff. Um, there has been a huge amount of research and academic studies looking at demand side response and also energy efficiency, but very little has been done on the kind of uh, interaction between the two. Because when this country is going to introduce the smart metering for next year, um, by doing that, there were two policy, um, policy objectives coming from DAC, which is, you know, we want people to, to engage with the demand side response, and also we want that as kind of an enabler or catalyst for energy consumption reduction. But there is kind of a not, we haven't got kind of very clear understanding between the synergies and trade-offs between those two policy objectives. So that's when, that's what, um, that's the area my research will be focusing on. As we talk about the demand side, kind of demand response, so British Gas guys, happy face, we're talking to you, if, if you switch your, uh, part of your electricity use, let's say your washing machines or dishwashers or sometimes even air conditioning, to the later part of your day, you can save a bit, probably you know, 50 pounds or 100 pounds a year on electricity bills. And also smart metering, because the government has, has invested a huge amount of money on the smart metering kind of in rollout across the country. So they're going to complete the, uh, the rollout by, uh, by 2020. So how are we going to utilize that, you know, that kind of um, expensive infrastructure? Um, is it going to do good only for demand side response? Is it going to, to do only for energy efficiency? Or is there kind of um, synergy that hasn't been you know, tapped into? And also energy poverty, because that's the, um, the area that the, the whole debate about kind of um, retail market review in the UK has been focusing on, because a lot of people um, have, have, been kind, kind of, have been kind of wrestling with the problem of rising electricity bills. Um, by the policy definition, if you spend like more than 10% of your disposable household income, you can be classified as energy poor. But actually, some people say, well, this definition should be changed because we're not just talking about energy poverty, we're also talking about kind of vulnerability. Because some people, they're not energy poor, but they're having kind of a um, um, chronic illness, so they should be targeted by the policy as well. So if, we, if the energy poverty kind of a group, if when they use the smart meters, when you're talking about kind of smart grid stuff, 
if they can reduce energy consumption, and if they can also benefit from you know, demand side response, that would be better because you reduce electricity bills and also you contribute to the low carbon development at the same time. So the um, one objective of this research is to, is to help to inform the policy making in, in, in this country to, um, to, to basically to capture the synergies while also considering kind of trade-offs in designing policies to promote more flexible demand, flexible demand and also the overall energy reduction. Um, my research has three objectives. The first one is basically to characterize the um, um, energy efficient, the energy efficiency measures and conservation measures that have been taken up in the uh, demand side response trials. Because often the market regulator has spent like five million pounds um, doing trials across the whole country to look at the innovative you know, solutions um, for demand side response. And domestic demand response is a big thing. So I'm going to in my research. I'm going to follow up on those kind of trials to look at what kind of um, energy efficiency and conservation measures have been taken on, and then to link those um, take up with the characteristics of demand side of response. Basically, to, to, to think about um, has the pricing, has the pricing regime, has a play, has role to play, <laughs> has the kind of consumer engagement policy, has a, has role to play. And has the kind of um, the community group, like kind of pe pe people been talking about community energy strategy in this country, which is quite novel across the whole globe. So, how this kind of uh, different bits of energy policy will fit to, to influence people's appetite of energy efficiency and conservation measures? That's the first question. And the second question will focus on the smart metering, because in, in the UK, as opposed to other countries like China or Italy, we're going to introduce the income display. But when you have a smart meter, it's in your in-home. Every household will have an in-home display which shows you how much energy you're using at this stage and also your historic consumption pattern and also the price and how much you can save if you do blah, 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 blah. So that kind of stuff. But the, the feedback is, um, has been focusing on the energy consumption only. Not much research has been done looking at the synergy and the interaction between um, demand side response and energy efficiency, like, I and mean, how people utilize the information given by the in-home display and to do and to achieve the, uh, the, the due kind of uh, dividend of energy efficiency and more flexible demand. And last question, I'm going to kind of extrapolate from what I found in the field to look at policies. Because in the UK, it's, it's a very interesting time to, to do this research because um, the government has introduced the, um, the electricity market reform, basically to first objective is to motivate um, the low carbon development. The second one is to, um, to reduce, reduce the electricity bills. So we've got many, many different kind of um, um, policy objectives. Some are complementary, but some are quite conflicting. So I'm going to look at you know, what I've found in the field and how that will translate into the policy making to capture the synergies between those two areas. As for the um, theoretical or analytical framework, we're going to talk about, um, sorry, for the time. Um, in the past, people have been talking about kind of um, um, ABC model, basically, your awareness, your choice, your, uh, your behavior in, in studying your energy consumption. But actually, that, frame, that framework has been flawed, it's been, it's been criticized for its kind of heavy reliance, heavy focus on the um, and the rationality of individuals. Alex talked about kind of the economic rationality of households in terms of investment and how to utilize your benefits. But actually, there are lots of other factors like psychology, psychological factors, and also technology, and also engagement from your consumers, that kind of stuff. So that can, um, they all have a role to play in influence kind of domestic energy use. Um, I basically interviewed some households um, in the UK who have done the kind of the trials with the British Gas EDF. And also, I'm going to introduce uh, interview some kind of stakeholder in, um, industry stakeholders and policymakers in DAC and Ofgen, and then also document analysis. Just very briefly about kind of uh, the findings. Um, there has a potential for time of use tariffs, basically demand side response to reduce energy consumption. But that kind of stuff really depends on household characteristics. Because some people, um, if they want to do it, the technology is not enabling. So um, so there was kind of different, 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 um, different factors. For instance, for more flexible 
appliance uh, displays, such as washing machines and dishwashers, uh, the engagement or the time use can increase the engagement of consumers to save more energy. Um, but um, the potential can be quite limited because they only do kind of um, the lower temperature of the heating and also the uh, um, they just wash code. And for the more less flexible appliances, there are huge potential for energy efficiency improvement, such as kind of um, in uh, your replacement with more efficient kind of refrigeration and also light bulbs. But the, the, the improvement in efficiency has also um, is subject to other factors like kind of the cost and for engagement and also whether the, the market is enabling to provide that kind of stuff. And also energy feedback, which gives people kind of link between what they what actions have taken place and the effect of the actions. The final slide, um, the, the relevance to, 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 to China. Um, as we talk about, the multi response has a potential to promote, in promoting integration of, of intermittent renewables, because China is, 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 is a world leader in kind of installing, developing renewable energies like wind and solar. So that kind of thing has that kind of practical implication. And also air pollution. We've been talking about air pollution for a long time. Um, when I was working for the British Embassy, they were talking about air pollution, kind of how we can trend, how we can extract the UK experience to help China, help Beijing to to, to you know to have a clear kind of um, air quality. So if we can do demand side response, we'll get rid of the more uh, less efficient um, peak plants, and also we, we will avoid kind of um, um, the coal-fired power plants. We can contribute to the um, to clean air and also energy efficiency. Uh, economic efficiency of the power system because we, do, we, we will need less um, inefficient and coal-fired power plants. And finally, because the uh, urbanization of the urbanization of the China and the rising middle class, we've been talking about if we have you know high income, we can endow ourselves with you know high-consuming lifestyles as people in the U.S. have. So if you can introduce the policy now, probably we can you know we can um, change the track so we can leapfrog. We can we can find an alternative pathway for developing our economy and also doing very good stuff for our environment. Thank you.